I'm sure <clears throat> it's just uh, because I'm an American that I have a sin-sodden soul, but I'd appreciate it if you would let me open in prayer once again. Heavenly Father, we would see Jesus today. Heavenly Father, we would hear Jesus today. Heavenly Father, we would be moved to love Jesus today. Amen. Amen. Could I ask those at the back to please close those doors? You may be familiar with the famous portrait of Cramner by Gerhard Flick. It's in the National Portrait Gallery. It's an arresting piece of artwork. Cramner looks out at us as if he had just been walked in on unexpectedly in his study. He is seated at a richly carpeted desk the billowing curtain behind him is drawn back, enabling the sun to provide good, plenty of good daylight for the archbishop's reading, which we have evidently interrupted. Two books and a letter lie on top of the table, evincing his engagement in study. Yet in his long, slender, and rather pale scholar's hands is the particular still open book from whose cons uh, consideration we have just distracted him. Due to its helpful labeling, we can see that the archbishop has been reading from the scriptures. Undoubtedly, Cramner is seeking to make a statement. He wants to be remembered as an archbishop whose most characteristic act is to read the Bible. Equally clear in the context of his times, such a depiction is a de polemical declaration of allegiance to church reform. If the Flick painting was intended to be hung in Lambeth Palace next to Holbein's portrait of William Warham, anyone knew who William Warham was? There we go, Archbishop Cramner's predecessor. Well done. I um, do we have any kind of uh, door prizes? <laughs> if the Flick portrait was hung next to the Warham portrait, its reformist message would have been evident to all who saw. Both archbishops are dressed in a white rochet and black shamir, wearing four stoles and black caps, and seated at a table in front of a richly woven curtain. Yet instead of an open Bible, besides Warham lies a prayer book open to the litany of the saints. Moreover, unlike Warham, Cramner has pulled back the curtain to let fresh light in an act which has in fact revealed three chipped window panes needing repair. Fun facts to know and tell, if you're doing, ever see the Cramner portrait online, if you don't see the three chipped window paintings, that means you're looking at a 20th century copy. It was uh, restored in the early part of the first decade of this millennium, and we discovered the three chipped windows. They had been obscured in the past. We had no idea they were there. Cramner, unlike Warham, knows he has restoration work to do. And for inspiration and strength for this task, he looks to God's word rather than to his now deceased servants in a litany of saints. Of course, Cramner does not have the whole Bible in his hands. 
The first complete text of Holy Scripture was in folio size. The first one in quarto, a hand size, was the work of Genevan exiles 15 years later. Of the two testaments as a Christian, leader Cramner naturally chose to be seen reading from the second. Still, somewhat unexpectedly, he is not depicted with a full New Testament in hand, despite the recent publishing advances associated with it. Cramner holds neither Erasmus's Novum Instrumentum, the land work reworking of the Vulgate Latin against the Greek, whose eloquence drew Thomas Bilney to Sola Fidenism, nor Tyndale's New Testament as it was written, whose catalog of ear-pleasing English phrases, freshly minted from the original, eventually made their way into the Great Bible, for which Cramner himself wrote a preface. In the Flick portrait, the primate of all England is seen reading from a volume containing only a portion of the New Testament. From someone so deeply inspired by the Erasmian principle that Christ was the index of the scriptures, not to mention the archbishop's own abiding interest in liturgy, one then could reasonably expect him to be holding a book of the Gospels. Yet, such is not the case. The volume opened in Cramner's hands is clearly labeled Paul's letters. Flick has exercised some artistic license, at least as far as my research has been able to determine. No such book was ever published in England during this period. Yet no embellishment could more clearly convey the key to Cramner's understanding of the Christian life in general and his work as archbishop in particular. Literally, as well as figuratively, Cramner's handbook is the writings of Paul. Now, we've heard this morning from 2 Peter the warning of what happens when teachers stray from scripture. It's a pastoral disaster. Fitzsimmons Allison likes to use the phrase, the title of his book, The Cruelty of Heresy. Didn't your heart burn within you when you thought about people just beginning to break free from the bondages and deceptions and destructive power of sin at work in their lives to have been hooked around a corner and brought back to the sorrow and despair, thinking they're finding freedom. That's the perfect introduction for our time together today because unlike Roman Catholicism, what is the heart of Roman Catholic theology? Thomas Aquinas and the scholastics try to bring faith and reason together in such and massive, intricate, law enduring edifice that all knowledge can be reconciled and brought under the dominion of Christ. That's the Roman Catholic vision. That's not the Anglican vision. Cramner's project is much more modest, much more pastoral. It's what is the saving knowledge for the cure of souls? What is the knowledge that sets the heart free from servitude to sin? What's the knowledge that unites us with Christ? And in him discovering fulfillment, our, our humanity, the fulfillment of our longings and birthing in us a love that not only extends to God, that not only extends to our fellow Christians, but it extends to those who despise and miserably use us. As Cramner's own life testifies to.
to begin to understand Anglican theology of the 16th century, we have to have a pastor's heart. And a pastor's heart that's tuned to the saving truths of Scripture, not the best intentions of humankind, not even the academic brilliance of medieval scholasticism. As a humanist, Cramner wants to go ad fontes, wants to go back to the sources. Do we have any former Boy Scouts here? Are there mountains around, or at least hills around Melbourne? With rivers? When you go on a camp out beside a river, where do you get the water? Below the Boy Scout camp? <laughs> or above the Boy Scout camp? Have I made my point about what it means by odd fontes? <laughs> Going beyond the best intention reasoning of later commentaries, but back to the word of God itself. And for Cramner, if we want to understand justification, we better begin with Paul. That, though, is not where the medieval church um, stopped in its understanding of justification. Although largely unrecognized by modern scholarship, there is a striking similarity between the current understanding of salvation in Judaism of Paul's time and that of the medieval Catholic church. Ever thought about that? What does covenantal gnomism claim? That you're in the covenant by grace because you're born a Jew and you receive circumcision when you're eight days old. But to stay in the covenant, what must you do? Good works. Now let's think about medieval Catholicism. What starts your journey of being right with God? When you're an adult? Infant baptism, that's literally an act of grace, isn't it? And what happens in baptism? Well, you've got a double problem when you're a baby. Original sin causes two issues. You have guilt that will damn you, but you're also born disordered. Yesterday we talked about that disorder. The technical name for it is concupiscence, lust of the flesh. And that just doesn't mean sexual lust. That means all loves out of their proper order. Like loving yourself more than God. Loving his gifts more than the giver. Now, this concupiscence is called a tender box. Boy Scouts, what's the difference? What's tender? It's kindling. What's fire? There's a big difference between tender and fire, right? For the medieval Catholics, the reason why they call concupiscence the tender box of sin is because it's not sin. It just tempts you to sin. Anyone old enough to remember Porky Pig? <laughs> Porky Pig, bad angel, whispering, that's concupiscence. What does baptism do? It pardons your guilt and infuses in you sanctifying grace. The Latin really literally means the grace that makes you pleasing. Without this grace in you, you're unworthy and unlovable. But with this, you are acceptable and embraced by God. 
and with the sanctifying inherent righteousness put in you, then you are clothed with a white robe. And the priest, unhelpfully in Latin, says, you are to present your soul as spotless on the day of judgment as it is right now. Now, when I talked about sanctifying grace with Protestants, that's confusing because not only do medieval Catholics and Protestants disagree about doctrine, they actually disagree on how to define words. What is grace for a Protestant? It's an aspect of God's character. It's how he feels towards us. He grants us unmerited value, worth, forgiveness, love. For a medieval Catholic, grace is a power at work in you that you must choose to cooperate with. Oh, oh wait. Palestinian Judaism, I'm in the covenant by grace, I stay in by works. In baptism, I'm made right with God, and now I have two porky pig angels, right? I have porky pig bad angel concupiscence, but now I have a power at work in me, the power of holiness, the power of God, sanctifying grace, the grace that makes me holy, the grace that keeps me pleasing, the grace that makes God to love me here. And what must I do if I'm going to present my soul holy and spotless as the garment I'm clothed in at my baptism? I have to choose. And... It's my choice that decides. If I choose to give to concupiscence, then it's no longer tinderbox, then there's a fire lit. And guess what happens if I choose to listen to concupiscence and sin? I'm damned to hell at that moment. And if I die out of a state of grace, I go straight to hell. Why do Roman Catholics want to have priests give the last rites on the deathbed? So you die at the very last moment assured of being in a state of grace. But let's say I make good choices. What happens? I get increase in personal righteousness. Everyone will have different stars in their crown because we will each, by working with grace, develop our own righteousness to be able to present to God on the day of judgment. Now, if I can choose either way, I gotta keep choosing, because if I choose bad, then I have to, what do I have to do if I choose wrongly? Go to confession and do penance and do lots of good works to eventually get God to consider that I have done my best to repair the damage. Not that I could ever do what was completely necessary, but at least I've done my best effort. And if I've done my best effort, then he decides and forgives me and restores me. And we go through the cycle. Do I know whether I will go to heaven? Not only that in medieval Catholicism is a virtue, not knowing your eternal fate. Why do you suppose it's a virtue? Because if you don't know, you'll work hard. Anyone ever been into a boarding school? I used to be a chaplain at a boarding school and we had an incredible student in maths. Well, a different story. A 13, a 14 year old boy gets a 99 on his Latin final exam. Now, I don't know if you understand with the British system, but 75 is really, really good. The British, they like in their education system to really let you know how much you don't know, so they structure the exams so the best will fail 30% of the points. He gets a 99. He gets invited in by the headmaster. 
Now, what do you think is going to happen? The headmaster brings him in and points out the one mistake he made and said, that's a sloppy error, bend over, and he canes him. This is true. Why did the headmaster do that? Not because he was a sick person. <laughs> From my American mentality, that's where I go, but no. because he's afraid that he will be overconfident from now on and will not work hard and will not do his best. And his job as a headmaster and as an educator is to make sure that this gifted young man always works as hard as he can so that he can be the best that he can be and therefore he needs to put fear in him of being sloppy. That captures the medieval church's understanding of motivation. You are not to know, you are to be left in uncertainty, and you are to live between fear and hope. Hope that you will make it, fear that you won't, so that you will give maximum effort. And the penitentials, the confessor, confessors are consciously instructed to use fear, shame, guilt, and duty to motivate people to do what? What do they have to do? To do their best, whatever that is. To be on a treadmill of constantly trying to prove to God, literally, that they're good enough to be loved by him. Now, they can't do that without Porky Pig, Good Angel, helping and encouraging. It's not all by themselves. But pastorally, what's it all about? Grace in the covenant, stay in by sweat equity. Let's go back to that portrait, which is now behind us. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you can see the three chip paintings. You see it, it, the, the, the handbook in his, uh, of Paul's letters. And there down on the desk, this one right here, the small one, unfortunately, that's illegible. We've done all sorts of things to try to recover it, but that's been lost in time. But the big book, we can read. And it is a copy of St. Augustine's of Faith and Good Works. And that's a really important signal to tell us what makes Cramner Protestant. On the one hand, Augustine clearly states that Paul's teaching on justification by faith means that good works do not precede justification. How can a work, how can an apple be an apple unless it falls from an apple tree? Good works don't fall from a bad tree. But he equally says, good works follow it. And why can good works not precede justification? Because only people who have received the Holy Spirit can perform works out of love, love for God, love for doing right. Doesn't that make sense? By this standard, the medieval church's teachings was at least pseudo-Augustinian, at worst, semi-Pelagian. Yes. I've been asked, what do you mean by semi-Pelagian? Pelagius was a monk in the fourth century who basically said that we have the inherent power in ourselves to do right and that God can reward us for what we do in our own strength. And semi-Pelagian is saying, well, grace is in there, but it's still up to you that you have to do a certain amount in your own strength in order for God to recognize and accept that. 
And then based on that, you're, you get the gift of grace. And therefore, grace is not totally free, but partially free. On the other hand, once Christ dwelt in the believer's heart by faith, this living faith necessarily produced good works performed out of love for God. Anyone have teenage boys? Has that magic moment come when his mother no longer has to suggest that it might be helpful for him to shower after playing basketball. (laughs) And he's now upset that he doesn't have a clean shirt for this morning. And he's now spending far too much time in front of the mirror. An old way of life is passing, right? And what is motivating this new life? Could it be love? Or at least hopes of love? Does he consider it a sacrifice now to shower? What he loves, he loves to please. And therefore, if faith is at work in us, surely the one we've come to know and love, we will desire to serve and obey, not as a hardship, but as a joy. Augustine is the source of effective theology. A. FF, not EFF, that our Christian life is to be motivated by renewed affections. Well, in short, for for, um, Augustine, authentic preaching of justification by faith cannot lead to lawlessness, for a good life was inseparable from faith And because life could not be good without faith, true faith could not but bear the fruit of a good life. By putting in this portrait both Paul's letters in his hands, but Augustine's textbook on effective theology on his desk, we can begin to see that he decides to go ad fontes to the early theologians not the medieval theologians on justification, and that directs him beyond Augustine back to Paul himself. And he will rethink his understanding of justification in light of Paul as pointed to by Augustine. Consequently, for the mature Cramner, the medieval emphasis on merit was simply a rebirth of the Pharisaic Christianity that Paul had opposed in his day. For Cramner, medieval theology, despite its best intentions, had emphasized staying right with God by your works. And that's exactly what Paul opposes. The medieval church believed that salvation, therefore, for Cramner, this teaching, first of all, is contrary to grace. Paul asserts that human merit and divine grace were mutually exclusive. Cramner quoting Paul. But certain it is that our election cometh only and wholly of the benefit and grace of God for the merits of Christ's passion and for no part of our merits and good works. As St. Paul disputeth and proveth at length in the epistle to the Romans and Galatians and device other places saying, if from works, then not from grace. If from grace, then not from works. The whole medieval system was really reasonable, understandable, not extremist, balancing grace and responsibility, 
God's part and our part? How many parents hasn't felt tempted to use fear, shame, guilt, and duty <laughs> to get recalcitrant teenagers to do what you want? To reason, you do our... But that's not what Paul says justification is all about, right? According to Paul, justification was either totally by relying on the worthiness of one's own efforts or completely by trusting in undeserved divine grace. Scripture, Scripture, Scripture gave no other option. Those individuals who sought the bypath, that's Cramner's word, bypath of their own merit as the way to God's favor departed from Christ and renounced his grace by relying on their own works even partially rather than full faith in God's promises they would not be justified in God's sight. Secondly, the medieval emphasis on human merit was a pastoral disaster. On the one hand, this teaching undermined true faith. For giving works any role in justification focused people's attention on their own actions and not on God's promise to redeem them. After all, to believe that a person did all his duty towards God left, left no need to have faith for the remission of sins. On the other hand, proving oneself to be good enough for God was an impossible task. Citing Paul's letter to the Galatians, once again, Cramner argued that no man can be justified by his own good works because no man fulfills the law to the full request of the law. Depending on justification, on our own merits, and applying our will to God's motions, why? That's, according to Cramner, the ready way to desperation. constantly being told you have to try to be good enough, never knowing if you are good enough. And if you're not good enough, you don't know God's love, are not worthy of God's love, and have no assurance of ever being with God's love. Isn't that the recipe for a pastoral disaster? Do you think Cramner would have had any trouble after listening to our Bible reading today and saying, despite their best efforts and their sincere desire, because they have departed from Scripture, the medieval theologians had become false teachers, hurting the souls of the people they were trying to help. Lastly, any meritorious role for human effort in justification was dishonest about human nature as well as demeaning to the glory of Christ. To suggest that human beings could ever become worthy of God's approval was to fail to face the deceitfulness of the human heart. We talked yesterday about Martin Luther's insight into concupiscence. That reason is not king in us. That we are moved by our shadowy subconscious in ways that only later by the grace of God do we begin to understand and perceive. And when we begin to realize that all of our best efforts, despite our best efforts, are still tainted by our recalcitrant self-centeredness and insecurities and anxieties. Who could ever say that I am inherently righteous and can come into the presence of God trusting in what's inside of me? Anybody here want to try that? <laughs> Listen to Cramner. For our own imperfection is so great through the corruption of original sin that all is imperfect that is in within us and therefore not apt to merit and deserve any part of our justification for us. Therefore, according to Cramner, here is the real purpose of justification. 
to express the weakness of man and the goodness of God, the great infirmity of ourselves and the might and power of God, the imperfection of our works and the most abundance of the grace of our Savior, and hereby wholly to ascribe the merit and deserving of our justification unto Christ only and his most precious blood shedding. Any attempt to, for ourselves to become acceptable by our works was an insult to the depth of divine love shown for an unworthy humanity by Christ's death on the cross. To suggest that we could any way contribute, quote, is the greatest arrogance and presumption of the man that Antichrist could erect against God. And throwing Antichrist in there is consciously fighting words. For it was the work and glory of God alone to justify the ungodly, to forgive sins, to give life freely out of his goodness, not from any merit of our own. Therefore, he looked for a doctrine of justification for the Church of England that would advance and set forth the true glory of Christ and suppress the vain glory of man. We've talked how Martin Luther put his finger on the Achilles heel of medieval soteriology. Sin is only sin when you consent to it. But the point of concupiscence is it twists us in ways that we're not aware of and do not consciously consent to. Therefore, any righteousness that is put in us is instantly tainted and not sufficient. Therefore, Luther develops the doctrine of imputed righteousness, that we need someone, a human being, whose righteousness is not tainted, and we need him to exchange our sinfulness with his righteousness, so that God would credit us with what he himself has done. And of course, the Greek word for justify is very different than the Latin word for justify. What is the Latin word for justify? Literally, it means to make righteous. But that's not the Greek of Paul's language. He uses the language of the courtroom to declare righteous. That God looks at Christ and sees Perfection, And because the righteousness is in Christ and not in us, it's not tainted by our concupiscence. And despite the ups and downs of our life, because our relationship with God is based on what Christ has, is, and will do for us, the power of the cross, the power of his resurrection at work in us, we can be confident that his love will not let us go. Well, how does this work in our lives? Can I have a volunteer very quickly? Hurry, somebody. Sir, could you come? <laughs> What's your name, sir? Anthony, I hope you're not a lost cause. Well, no, I, uh, I uncrossed my legs a couple of minutes ago, so it's woken up now. <laughs> Good. Turn around. All right, turn around, Anthony. Let's see if I get this space just right. Please fall back. Thank you. No, thank you. Now, <laughs> now, Anthony, what's the worst? Are you from Melbourne? No, Sydney. Uh, what's the worst part of Sydney? Uh... <laughs> Redfern, maybe? Uh, the Cross. The Cross. Okay, yeah. the Cross. King's Cross? Yeah. Same in London, by the way. King's Cross, um, it's 3 a.m. It's a dark alley. You don't know me. I come up and say, please turn around and fall back. <laughs> Are you going to do that? Possibly the turn around part. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to fall back? No. <laughs> Why not? Uh, no established relationship with which to trust you. Is it that you don't have the willpower to trust me? Uh, no, just 
common sense. What, what are you lacking? Anything in you. It's, you don't know whether I'm trustworthy. Hmm. For you to have faith in me, you have to know whether I'm faithful. It's not about you, right? Yep. It's about me. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> For the medievals, faith is the willpower to believe the teachings of the church. That's not the reformers' understanding. Faith is a gift. A gift that comes from what? God's gracious self-revelation. To know God is to know he is trustworthy. And when you know him, you find within you a new power to trust him. And therefore, it starts with the word. We said yesterday that it was both the knowledge of the way of salvation and the power for salvation because with God's word goes God's breath and God writes his truth, his trustworthiness on the heart of the people. And therefore, you must proclaim the gospel and God will grant saving faith to those who hear. But you know, it's often described justification by faith as if it's a cold accountant's bookkeeping trick, as if there is no internal change in the justified. That's simply not true. If you read the doctrine, if you read Luther, if you read Melanchthon, they realize that faith is always accompanied by love. If you encounter someone who's faithful to rescue you from your burden, what is stirred in your heart? Love for the rescuer. But it's love because one has been rescued it's love as the fruit of faithfulness. It's not that God sees your love and says, oh, because you love me, I will love you. What does the Bible tell us about that? We love him because he first loved us. So in justification, you have both faith and love. Faith is what joins you to Christ by trusting in his promises, love is the fruit of that union. Why is this important to realize? Well, it goes back to the very basic understanding of human nature according to uh, the Lutherans, which Cramner picks up. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. Ever heard that? That's not Cramner's words, so please don't tweet Cramner said. But it is, at least in my opinion, an accurate depiction of his understanding of how human nature works. Anybody here married? When you decided to get married, sir, you'd realize this was the biggest merger decision of your life, right? So you wrote up a job description, <laughs> you advertised, you took in resumes, you made a short list, you interviewed the lucky candidates, did background checks, and when you decided which was the most best, you, you told them they got the job, right? Is that the way it worked? <laughs> what the heart loves, the will chooses, right? And your, your parents, they love you, don't they? Yeah. And they weren't necessarily, sorry? But they said don't do it. <laughs> They weren't necessarily trying to stop it. But being older and wiser, 
they could see that perhaps when two young people come together, they're not quite used to knowing what it means to live together and there was gonna be some issues and because they loved you, they tried to, well, prepare you for those issues, right? And help you understand what was gonna happen, right? And you listened to every word? <laughs> what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. And therefore, according to Lutherans, if we're going to escape from loving self, we need, our heart needs to be captivated by a stronger love, a love for God. And that can only come from knowing God has loved us enough to freely and assuredly save us by faith. Help me out here. Fear, shame, guilt, and duty. Does that produce love? What produces love? Knowing we're loved. And that is the heart of the doctrine of justification by faith for the reformers, that it alone has the power to change the human heart because it alone shows us the depth of God's sacrificial love for humanity. And the failure to teach justification by faith leaves people not knowing God loves them, leads them, leaves them trapped and only being able to love themselves as a result. An insult to God's honor and a dramatic failure of pastoral responsibility. Cramner himself in 1538 makes clear that he subscribes to this understanding of what is the product of justification by faith. If the profession of our faith of the remission of our own sins enters within to the deepness of our heart that it must needs kindle a, a warm fire of love in our hearts towards God and towards all others for the love of God. A fervent mind to seek and procure God's honor, will, pleasure in all things. A good will to help every man and to do good unto them so far as our might, wisdom, learning, counsel, health, strength, and all other gifts which we have received of God will extend. In summary, a firm intent and purpose to do all that is good and leave all that is evil. When the truth of justification is written in the deep depths of our heart, a love will emerge. And what will that love do? Shape our choices direct our thinking. That's the heart of 16th century Anglican um, anthropology. Cramner, surprise, surprise, puts these truths in the homily on salvation, making it standard doctrine for the Church of England, and according to the Articles of Religion, the 39 Articles, if I want to know about justification, where should I go? Go to the homily on justification. And in it, why don't I be kind to you and you just trust me? Humanity's ongoing struggle with sinful self-centeredness renders it impossible for them ever to be holy in their own right. Quote from the homily, because all men be sinners and offenders against God, every man of necessity is constrained to seek another righteousness or justification to be received at God's own hands. But through faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross, Christians can receive the benefit of Jesus' holiness. Quote, Christ is now the righteousness of all them that truly believe in him for as much as their infirmity lacketh, read concupiscence, for as much as their infirmity lacketh, Christ's justice hath supplied. 
This righteousness gives to the believer, given to the believer through faith in Christ is not a perfect personal righteousness which God has implanted inside them, but God's external transferring of Christ's credit to their need. Quote from the homily. This justification is taken, accepted, and allowed of God for our perfect and full justification. Unquote. Cravener is very clear that the kind of faith we're talking about, the gift, it's not a work, it's a gift from God. And he's also clear that he prefers not justification by faith alone, he prefers the phrase justification by faith only. Because he wants you to know that love is in there too, but love doesn't justify, it's the fruit of assurance of salvation. For Cramner, faith in the saving message of the cross brings assurance. Assurance births gratitude. Gratitude births love. Love brings forth repentance. Repentance births good works. And good works brings forth a better society. Would you like me to repeat that? Faith in the saving message of the cross brings forth assurance. Assurance births gratitude. Gratitude births love. Love births repentance. Repentance brings forth good works. And good works bring forth a better society. Naturally, Cramner ends the homily on justification by referring to the power of renewed affections made possible by the gospel of justification by faith. From this assurance of salvation doth follow a loving heart to obey his commandments. When the benefits of God's mercy are graceful, merciful grace are considered, unless we be desperate persons with hearts harder than stone, we will be moved to give ourselves wholly unto God in the service of our neighbors as well. Have you noticed how I open every talk? We'd like to see Jesus, hear Jesus, be moved to love and serve. Jesus, the proclamation of the gospel, the salvation by grace through faith, we pray God takes those promises and moves our hearts to love and serve him. Well, why does it matter today to take a comment from this morning's Bible study? Who believes in justification by faith anymore? I was recently at a dinner party and I was talking a little bit about my experiences as an Olympic chaplain and the, one of the dinner guests looked at me and it was quite clear he thought I was joking. <laughs> now, I wouldn't have any idea why he might think it was me putting him on. <laughs> but do you want to know the secret why a person who looks like me and talks like me can have an over 30 year pastoral ministry with elite athletes? Sorry? They don't feel threatened by you. I was suggested because they don't feel threatened by me. Which is actually really important as well. It's really very true. I just give them Cramner for jocks. Seriously. If your whole world is based on what you have to earn, and you hear the gospel, guess what you do with that? You twist it and make it another opportunity to prove your worth. Fitzsimmons Allison has a wonderful saying as well. It's about gospel entropy. What's entropy? That without energy expended, everything tends to maximum randomness. What's the classic a high school chemistry textbook example of entropy? A high school student's bedroom. (laughs) 
There is no gospel help in one generation that doesn't become a gospel hindrance in a succeeding generation. Human nature will always twist out of fear and therefore to control that if I earn, I can be confident or out of pride. And I have spent two, you know the, the number one question that I'm asked by Christian athletes in the Olympic Village who don't meet their goals? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned that God has felt that he cannot be with me and the devil doesn't miss an opportunity to point out thoughts or actions under pressure to explain to the athlete why they have lost. Is that the gospel? But that's what we do with it. Why is justification by faith important? Whether you're an Olympic athlete, a lost teenager, or going through a midlife crisis, it is the human condition to find some way to justify ourselves and to be on a treadmill of justification or running through numbing ourselves to the fear that we can't justify ourselves, but to be constantly wrestling with it. And the only thing that frees us from the deceptions of the lies of the enemy is to know that Christ says it is finished. I not only have given you a reliable message of what the salvation is, I have fulfilled it and will birth in you a faith and my love will not let you go until you love me as strongly as I love you. How does justification by faith really work? Anyone here make homemade ice cream? What do you use with homemade ice cream? Eggs, cream, milk, maybe some fruit, peaches. Does it look very good when you have it all done, mixed in the bowl? Does it look appetizing? This said, Ben said, yes, he's not from Kansas. <laughs> when I look at it, it's like, ugh. Does it bother you when you look at it and it's ugly? Why not? because you know what all that churning, churning, churning is going to do. God accepts us because of Christ, because he knows his love in the age to come is going to make us look perfectly like Christ. That the power of his blood, the power of the resurrection will complete its work and we will have Christ-likeness because that's his promise to us and he is faithful. In a world that is so insecure and anxious, whether they are lovable and are spending countless energies trying to prove it or run from it, we must recapture the pastoral healing power of the doctrine of justification by faith it's the biblical doctrine, and it's our legacy as Anglicans. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ashley. I think what you've done today is, um, is, is lived out before us what you've been preaching around uh, our affections being moved by this great doctrine. So thank you. We're in your debt. Would you please thank Ashley? Thank you.